This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. This video will acquaint you with the clinical presentation of patients with a foreign body in the external auditory canal or nasal passage and the general principles and most effective techniques for smooth and safe retrieval. The first attempt at removal of a foreign object is the one most likely to succeed and preparation is important. Be sure to explain the procedure completely to the patient and his or her family or guardian. Hand washing and the use of non-sterile gloves for the procedure are considered best practice. Most young patients require immobilization with the papoose board. Papoose boards are available in sizes that generally accommodate patients from the neonatal period to eight years of age. Immobilizing the child on a papoose board will increase the likelihood that the procedure will be successful and may decrease the need for procedural sedation or general anesthesia. When available, a child life specialist to work with and prepare the child and family may be helpful. Most patients with foreign bodies that are lodged in the external auditory canal are children. Clinicians should be aware that adults who have a foreign body lodged in the external auditory canal may have cognitive dysfunction or a psychiatric disorder. Foreign bodies in the ear may cause ear pain, a sense of fullness, decreased hearing, oral drainage, or no symptoms at all. The ear canal is divided into outer cartilaginous and inner bony portions. The two portions are connected by a narrow isthmus. The external auditory canal has abundant neural endings and is highly vascular, which means that instrumentation may be painful or may cause bleeding. The anatomy of the ear varies from patient to patient. In order to optimize your view of the full external canal, you may need to retract the pinna upwards or downwards. An otoscope equipped with the largest speculum that fits comfortably into the ear canal should be used to increase your working space. Alternatively, a headlight and a nasal speculum can be used to visualize the foreign body. Handheld operating otoscopes with a round head are best suited to removing a foreign body. The round head provides a magnification factor of 2.5 times, and the eyepiece rotates to provide adequate space for retrieval of the foreign body. The eyepiece of otoscopes with a square head limits the space in which you can manipulate the instruments and therefore should not be used. The use of a basic surgical microscope, when available, can reduce the incidence of failed extractions and complications. Most foreign bodies in the external auditory canal can be divided into two categories, graspable and non-graspable. It is important to assemble a variety of instruments in several sizes before you begin. Graspable foreign bodies such as paper, cotton, or foam usually have a visible edge. Under direct visualization, you can use alligator forceps to grasp the edge of the object and smoothly remove it. Alligator forceps come in a variety of sizes. The best sizes for the removal of a foreign object from the ear are between six and eight millimeters. It is important to use alligator forceps rather than Toby forceps, since each has a different mechanical action. Alligator forceps are finer, and the location of the hinge limits the extent to which the jaws can open. These features enable these forceps to retrieve smaller, flatter foreign bodies, and are the most useful in the external auditory canal. In order to remove foreign objects that cannot be grasped, such as beads, rocks, or toy parts, it is preferable to use irrigation, suction devices, or tools such as wire loops, curettes, or right angle hooks. The irrigation technique requires flow and volume of water that is adequate to provide a brisk spray along the superior margin of the external auditory canal. The stream of water should go beyond the foreign object inside the ear canal and push it out. Ir irrigation should be performed with water warmed to body temperature to prevent the development of nystagmus or vertigo in the patient. 
If you want to create your own irrigation device, cut the needle off of a butterfly cannula. The soft, flexible, non-traumatic tubing can be introduced into the external auditory canal with ease. Attach a 20 to 50 milliliter syringe filled with water to the plastic tubing. Irrigation is contraindicated in patients with a known tympanic membrane perforation or when removing plant or food material, such as beans or seeds, which may swell. Irrigation should also be avoided in the removal of a battery, since water may accelerate liquefactive necrosis. Free-floating or round objects that are not impacted in the external auditory canal can be removed with suction. Under direct visualization, Insert a number five or number seven suction tip with the finger hole open and align the suction tip with the object. Occlude the finger hole and then remove the suction tip and the foreign object from the external auditory canal as a single unit. A right angle hook may also be used. Round or breakable foreign objects can be removed with a wire loop, turret, or right angle hook. Insert the instrument beyond the foreign object, rotate the instrument, and carefully withdraw the object. Select the instrument for removal according to the location, shape, and composition of the foreign body. Depending on the nature of the foreign body, you may want to use alligator forceps, an irrigation syringe, a suction tip, a wire loop, a curette, or a right angle hook. Several categories of foreign bodies in the external canal require special consideration. When insects crawl or fly into the external auditory canal, they create an uncomfortable sensation for the patient. Insects should be killed before any attempt is made to extract them in order to avoid having parts of the insect embedded in the canal. To kill an insect, instill drops of lidocaine, isopropyl alcohol, or warm, not hot, mineral oil. Then use a suction or irrigation technique to remove the intact body. Forceps should not be used since they can fragment the body of the insect. When a patient has a foreign object in the external auditory canal that is impacted, the pain may be so extreme that the patient will not be able to tolerate the procedure while awake. The degree of pain will not be controlled with the level of sedation available in most emergency departments. In addition to the low rate of success in removing an impacted foreign object from the external auditory canal in a patient who is awake, there is also a high likelihood of bleeding and lacerations if removal is attempted. These problems make a strong case for not performing manipulation while such a patient is awake and for arranging for removal while the patient is under general anesthesia in the operating room. Button cell batteries and magnets in the external auditory canal constitute a true emergency and require immediate removal. Electric current from a battery can destroy surrounding tissue. Use forceps and direct visualization to retrieve the battery. Irrigation should not be used in these cases. Refer the patient to specialty care as soon as possible so that damage to the surrounding tissue may be assessed. Complications associated with foreign objects in the external auditory canal can include ear pain, infection, oral drainage, and conductive hearing loss. Retained batteries or magnets may cause permanent tissue damage in the canal or injury to the tympanic membrane. Complications associated with the removal of foreign objects from the ear include laceration and bleeding of the external auditory canal, perforation of the tympanic membrane, and on rare occasions, ossicular disruption with subsequent hearing loss or vertigo. Most foreign bodies lodged in the nose occur in children. Persistent, unilateral, purulent, foul-smelling nasal discharge in a child is most commonly caused by a foreign body. The nose has two anterior nasal fossae or vaults, which are separated by the vertical nasal septum. There are three turbinates attached to the lateral wall in each anterior nasal cavity, the inferior, middle, and superior nasal turbinates. Do not mistake the turbinates for foreign bodies or tumors. The nasal lining is thin, fragile, and highly vascular. 
There are many types of retained nasal foreign bodies. 70% are inorganic items such as beads, paper, or stones. Unless the object is a battery or magnet, the presence of a nasal foreign body is not a true emergency. Radiography is not usually necessary because most foreign bodies in the nose are not radioopaque and will easily be seen on anterior rhinoscopy. In most instances, foreign bodies are inserted into the most anterior part of the nasal vault and can be seen on anterior rhinoscopy after suctioning secretions and administering decongestants to decrease swelling. Use topical anesthetic lidocaine to control local pain and oxymetazoline drops to induce vasoconstriction, which will increase the patient's tolerance for the procedure, improve visualization, and increase the working space in the nose. Combine lidocaine drops and oxymetazoline drops in one dropper in order to administer the two medications simultaneously. Administer the drops twice. The first set of drops will make initial contact with the inferior turbinate and decongest it, allowing the second set of drops to reach and decongest the middle turbinate. The second set of drops should be administered three to five minutes after the first. This procedure will markedly improve visualization and increase the space for instrumentation. Next, immobilize the patient or obtain additional help to stabilize the head if necessary. For nasal foreign bodies, a headlight or otoscope can be used for illumination. You may need a nasal speculum, toby forceps, bayonet forceps, suction tips of various sizes, hooks or loop curettes. Foreign objects in the nose are defined as graspable or non-graspable. Objects that are soft or have a distinct edge are amenable to removal with the grasping technique and the use of forceps. When removing graspable objects from the nasal passage, toby or bayonet forceps are usually more useful than alligator forceps. When using forceps to reduce the risk of fragmentation, gently grasp the foreign object without completely closing the jaws of the instrument. Fragmentation will make complete removal more difficult. Use suction for smooth, round, or free-floating objects. To use this technique, visualize the foreign object and gently place the tip of the suction device on the foreign body with the finger control open. When the tip of the suction device abuts the object, occlude this hole with your thumb and withdraw the device and the object as a unit. A right angle hook can also be used to remove smooth, round, foreign objects. Insert the instrument beyond the foreign object, rotate the instrument, and carefully withdraw the object. This procedure can also be performed using a wire, loop, or curette. Complications associated with retained foreign bodies in the nose include sinusitis and, if the object is a battery or magnet, perforation of the nasal septum. Button cell batteries and magnets in the nose must be removed as quickly as possible to avoid necrosis of the surrounding tissue. Extensive damage, including septal perforation, can occur within an hour or two after insertion of the foreign object. The most common complication related to attempts at removal is minor epistaxis. If bleeding occurs, use cotton pledgets that are impregnated with oxymetazoline to control bleeding. Successful removal of a foreign body from the external auditory canal or the nasal passage depends on the size, shape, texture, and composition of the object, the length of time the object has been lodged, the patient's anatomy, the presence or absence of infection, and the number and nature of any previous removal attempts. The likelihood of success for retrieval in an outpatient setting decreases with each additional attempt. It is important to keep the patient still, using passive restraint or sedation, and to use appropriate equipment with excellent illumination. The operator's technical skills and experience contribute to successful removal. Practice will increase confidence, improve technical skills, and increase the likelihood of success.